Hello again, and welcome back. In this section, we're going to discuss all the ways that inflammation can present in synovial joints. So remember that these joints are numerous in our body and quite mobile, so they're often injured. So after this video, I'd like you to be able to differentiate the three main types of arthritis and describe joint changes with the inflammation of a bursa, or bursi, which is the plural of bursa. So as this section kind of focuses on what could go wrong with synovial joints, I want to use a case study to walk us through this information. So I want to lay a disclaimer out there right from the beginning that I am not a physician. So I'll always pr approach these types of case studies and clinical connections from an anatomical lens. So we'll start here with this case study. The patient here is an active 19 year old college student with wrist pain and intermittent immobility. And that immobility ex is exacerbated by stress. So they explain that some days it hurts to flex or extend the wrist at all, and it's definitely affecting their quality of life. And here you can see me flexing and extending my wrist. So the patient visits a sports medicine physician who sees crowded carpals on the radiograph, which they think may contribute to some limited mobility of the joint, but they refer the patient to a rheumatologist for further testing. So here we see these carpal bones. There's actually a synovial joint between each of them. And the spaces between them is a little bit smaller than usual, but not enough to explain the symptoms of this person. Now, a rheumatologist specializes in conditions related to the immune system. So one of these conditions is arthritis. Now, there are many types of arthritis, but we're going to focus on the most common three. The first being rheumatoid arthritis. Now, this is an autoimmune arthritis where the body is actually attacking the synovial membrane. So this presents with swollen, stiff, and painful joints and often affects the hands like we see in this image. So this inflammation limits the joint space, like the actual space between, and changes the consistency of the synovial fluid. So this can lead to breakdown of the different structures within a synovial joint, like that articular cartilage, and potentially start to break down bone when that is exposed. Now the second type is osteoarthritis, and this is more common with age. So as we age, there is wear and tear on the articular cartilage, and there's also a decrease in synovial fluid production. So essentially, the cushion of the joint is going away. So the bones of the joint may come in contact with one another. And if this cartilage fully breaks down, both the articular cartilage like this one seen here, but also the supportive fibrocartilage that might be found in that articular cavity, this can lead to bone on bone rubbing. And this will break down bone a lot faster. The final type of arthritis is known as crystal arthritis or gout. Gout comes from an inability to break down purines properly, and uric acid that's left behind will crystallize, and this crystallizes often in joint structures. So this is most common here, like we see in this image, in the big toe. Now this leads to erosion of the joint structures over time, and people experience quite a bit of pain with this. Now these three types of arthritis have largely different mechanisms, but all lead to the same problems, pain and damage to joints. And when a joint and its structures are damaged to the point of bone contacting bone, this is when a surgical replacement of those articular parts might be needed. So in the end, all of these mechanisms really lead to the same thing, and that's the breakdown of bone. So let's get back to our patient. So the rheumatologist orders blood tests and they come back positive for anti 
nuclear antibodies, and that's related to autoimmune disorders. They also have high uric acid levels. So looking at this radiograph, a trained healthcare provider can see no evidence of bone erosion here. And so the autoimmune arthrit rheumatoid arthritis is taken off the table for this person. So instead, the rheumatologist suspects gout based on the high uric acid levels in the blood. So they recommend a low purine diet since purines break down into uric acid and this person may have a limited ability to clear it. So let's leave our patient here. They're going home and they're going to make some diet changes. Another structure that can be inflamed and cause problems in joint functioning are bursa. Inflammation of a bursa is called bursitis. So this results from repetitive strain on a structure and leads to a reduced range of motion and pain while trying to move. So here are some questions for you. First, I want you to brainstorm some areas of the body where there's excess friction where we might find a bursa. Remember that bursa can be found between bone and skin, between bone and tendon, or between bone and ligament or ligaments. Now, there are about 150 bursa in your body, so I don't expect you to think of all of them. But once you think of a few, now take those and think about what structures might be compressed or damaged if that bursa were inflamed. So pause so you can take a moment to think about some of these. And write down your answers. So let's start with areas where bone is close to skin. So some places where we can really feel the bones right underneath our skin are the elbow, the knee, the ankle, on the sides of it, those medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus, also the heel, the calcaneus. And also under the sit bones are the ischial tuberosities. So if you were to sit on your hands, those are the ischial tuberosities. So now between bone and tendons, what are some prominent tendons you might think about? So there's one right, at, there are three that come together at the medial knee, and this is called a pezanserinus, where three muscles come together right at that space. There's an important bursa there. We can also find them within the shoulder, within the hip, on the lateral side, and you can think of the Achilles tendon or the calcaneal tendon. And another can be those tendon sheaths. Those were those specializations of bursa that cover tendons directly. Now which type of structures could be compressed? So definitely the joint space itself and the cartilage within that joint space. Oftentimes, right through a joint, we'll find tendons passing through. And in a case we'll talk about on the next slide, nerves can be compressed by these bursa.
So on this slide, I have a couple examples of bursitis. We'll talk more about these when we actually get into the regional lectures, but I wanted you to see some examples. So for this first one over here, I want you to imagine a day of studying. You're sitting at your desk or your table all day. You either have whole things full of papers and books and computers and tablets and phones and snacks. And so all of this studying is likely done with your elbows on the table. So sometimes this bursa here, that olecranon bursa, when it is inflamed, this can be called student's elbow. So you can imagine there's the bone is quite close to the skin there, and that cushion right underneath it, that bursa, can become inflamed. And we see how that appears on a person, and it would look kind of on this radiograph, we could see that there was one, and then I added in a fake inflamed bursa, so you can see how that would grow and really uh, change the space there. So there's a bursa in the shoulder that sits underneath the clavicle and the scapula here and above the humerus. So this space is bounded by bone. Now if we imagine we abduct the humerus or put our arm above our head, this space actually is going to get smaller. And there's a tendon running through here. So already there's a lot of pressure on that tendon in this small space. Now if you add an inflammation of the bursa, this just exacerbates that problem. So this can make raising the arm above the head very painful and could lead to injury of that tendon, which is part of the rotator cuff. So the last one here is back to where those flexors of the hand or the wrist are covered in tendon sheaths. And those pass through this space in the wrist that's bound here by bone and by a tight ligament. And they course through these tendons with the sheaths and there's a nerve that courses through here, the median nerve. So if these tendon sheaths swell in size, the pressure on that median nerve can lead to numbness in the hand and overall pain in the movement of the wrist. So now that we have more options for our patient, let's see how they're doing with their diet. So they report back and they've been good about sticking to the low purine diet by really eating fully vegetarian and then also avoiding other high purine foods and drinks. So their blood tests show normal levels of uric acid, but the patient notes no change in the pain and the immobility of the wrist. So based on the anti-nuclear antibodies positive in their previous blood work, the rheumatologist suspects that this person is having joint pain associated with lupus, which is an autoimmune disorder. The patient is prescribed a medication, hydroxychloroquine, to suppress the immune system and hope to help with the pain. Now, the patient takes the medication as normal, but is feeling a little bit stuck, so they actually seek a second opinion. Now, after explaining everything in detail to the new rheumatologist, they note a large bump on the posterior aspect of the wrist. A ganglion cyst, like the one shown here, is actually a herniation of the tendon sheaths that can affect the joint movement and cause pain. So the patient takes the referral to a hand surgeon and has the ganglion cyst surgically removed. They basically cut out the part of the sheath that's herniated. So while this can herniate again, it tends to have good outcomes. So in this patient, once they recovered from the surgery, they did find improvements in the pain and the immobility. And they also started doing regular stretching and strengthening and eventually was able to use their wrist as they did before this whole ordeal. So you can see these are those tendon sheaths on the back of the wrist or the posterior aspect of the wrist and so the ganglion cyst was a herniation of one of these. So you may be thinking you seem really familiar with this case and you'd be right because that's me. Don't you like my cool photo of my wrist? Anyway this whole thing started back in high school and was finally resolved around five years later. 
so that ganglion cyst would kind of grow and shrink with time, and likely the rheumatologist was onto something, thinking about it being autoimmune. However, removing that cyst really did the job of stopping the swelling from happening, and things have been great so far since. So I hope you enjoyed that little case study and kind of a discussion of how these synovial joints could be inflamed and what it might look like. I appreciate your attention, and I'll see you in the next video.